the long-term fiscal position. Gentleman's time Thank has expired. You. Mr. Gowdy from South Carolina is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman, Mr. Chairman, from North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, um, is there an interconnectivity between cost of energy and economic recovery? Uh, yes, there is, uh, particularly when there is a supply side element, which there appears to be, uh, given some reductions in available supply and tensions in Iran and so on. Um, higher energy prices uh, create uh, at least short term inflation pressures. And moreover, they, are, uh, they act as a tax on household purchasing power and reduce consumption spending, and, and that also is a, a drag on the economy. So yes, um, uh, higher oil prices, higher energy prices are a concern. And I think the price per gallon in Europe is about double, um, if not more, than what it is in the United States? Yes, because of much higher taxes. So can you imagine any scenario under which uh, someone would advocate for boosting our price per gallon to European levels? Well, there, there are a lot of policy issues related to that. I um, mean, an I economic reason, the, not environmental, economic. Well, um, to, it, the question is whether or not there are other goals that are served, environmental goals, congestion goals, and the like. I'm just asking from an economic from standpoint. Econo from a purely you know, GDP growth perspective, I think, uh, you know, I think higher energy prices would probably slow growth, at least in the short run. Well, what word would you use to describe it if our price per gallon talismanically doubled? That would have a... a Catastrophic? I wouldn't say catastrophic, but it would have a very, uh, obviously a very negative effect on consumers, uh, consumer confidence, consumer real incomes, at the same time that it would push up inflation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, what is our debt as a percentage of GDP currently? Uh, I can give you the precise numbers in writing, but uh, as we measure it, which is... I'm not going to hold you to a precise number, just, just something around that a lawyer can understand. As we, as we measure it, uh, which is uh, debt held by the public, and we try to measure it net of financial assets, which is the appropriate way to do it financially, our debt to GDP ratio is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of GDP today. All right. Since I have been here, there has been one request for an increase in the debt ceiling. I understand there's another one coming. I don't know whether it will come before the first Tuesday in November or after the first Tuesday in November. I want you to assume, and again, I'm not going to hold you to the number. You don't need to go research it. Uh, you're smart enough. I've seen you testify before enough to know that you probably will be able to answer this question off the top of your head. If this were the last debt ceiling increase you could ask for, the final one, and you had to make it large enough for all current and future obligations, what would the request need to be? Well, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. Let me answer it slightly differently. It, may, it makes no sense for the country, since Congress controls how much we can borrow every year. We have no independent authority to spend beyond what Congress authorizes. For Congress to put itself and its members through the position every six months or every year to hold a separate vote, politically difficult vote, on whether they should continue to authorize us to do things they've already authorized us to do. But I don't know how to answer that question, because you're, you're talking about um, the future. The best way to... Well, the last debt ceiling increase was for how long and for how much? Well, uh, well the, under the deal we reached last August, uh, we set up a mechanism, I believe, where Congress uh, imposed on itself three votes over a 15-month period. Uh, what will be the amount of the increase uh, in November or December? Well, it depends. You know, this is Congress makes this choice, and the Congress has to make the choice based on how much time they want to give them. So right, but you've seen the numbers. In fact, you, I, I made a note. You used the exact same word that Chairman Ryan uses, and I hope they don't run any ads showing you pushing a senior citizen off a cliff in a wheelchair for using that word. But you just used the word unsustainable. Right. So my question to you is, if we had one more chance to borrow all the money that we need, assuming current variables, how big would that number have to be? I don't know how to answer that. I think that if you, uh, let me try this a little differently. You, you'll have to decide as a member of Congress how much time you want to give Congress before you have to vote on it again. And you can choose that amount of time. The larger the number you create, the do it. But again, the debt limit uh, doesn't decide how much we can borrow. 
you decide how much we can borrow because every year you decide how, what how much can debt would we need to meet current and future obligations, assuming the status quo indefinitely. Well, that that I'd be happy to get you in writing. I can't do it in my head though. How about a round number? No, no idea. I just can't do it in writing. But if if your question is, is that if Congress authorized no additional increase in spending or revenues right. forever, how much we have to borrow? Uh, I, I can do that question in math, but I got to. Twenty trillion. I, I, I just can't do it in my head. Fifty trillion. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen you work before. You're smart. You're quick. <laughs> Not smart enough. A to lot. The can we agree? It'd be a lot. It would be a lot. Uh, it would make you uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of minutes. Thank you very much. The, um, I want to just go back to uh, just a, a matter that we, that the chairman brought up um, on Monday in, in Brooklyn as a hearing, um, and just get your opinion on this. We had uh, major banks there, and he and we asked the question about how you know when we, interest rates are lower, and let's say somebody has a, a mortgage at six percent now, and they are say underwater. Um, we were asking him, he, he was asking the banks, what is, uh, what's the negative side, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chairman, of trying to make sure that those people are able to take advantage of lower interest rates. I mean, do you all see that as one of the, you talked about a number of remedies. In other words, did you understand my question? Uh, I mean, I just wanted your opinion on that. It seems like a lot of people would fall into that category. No, exactly right. And, uh, and that's why it's so important that you give people the opportunity to refinance to take advantage of lower rates. And one of the most important things that we have done and what the head of the FHFA has done over the last six months is to put in place a much better designed program to help people who are significantly underwater take advantage of lower interest rates. But we want that to happen on a much larger scale. That program is actually getting quite a lot of traction now. You are seeing a, as you may have heard in New York, a very substantial increase in refinancing by people who are significantly underwater. And we think we are at the early stage of that increase, expect much more to happen. Now, those programs now only, only apply to the loans that have been guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie. And so we have also suggested that Congress consider authorizing the FHA to provide an additional program in that context, too, just to be fair. You know, most people, you know, they are not sure who, who guaranteed their loan, and we want to make sure those opportunities are available to any, everybody who owns a house. The uh, one, just last question, the um, one of the things that, that I looked at was that this whole idea of um, when the banks did their settlement, um, FHFA uh, did not bring them under those provisions for writing. I mean, as a matter of fact, they didn't. They said we don't want to be a part of that. And I know that you were talking to uh, Mr. DeMarco. Um, was that a concern of yours, particularly when uh, we have tripled the incentives for uh, those kinds of things? I am just curious. Well, uh, as I said, um, there is a very strong economic case in some circumstances. Uh, and that's why you're seeing private investors do it to reduce principal for people who are deeply underwater but but can but can afford to stay in their home meet a reasonable payment, and that case uh, will be equally compelling in parts of the people whose loans were guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie. And so what we're trying to do is encourage uh, Mr. DeMarco, uh, who is fully independent and has to I, I understand that. Own, yeah. to take another look at the evidence because we think there is a place for doing more in a way that is completely consistent with the mandate that Congress gave him appropriately to make sure he is protecting the interests of the taxpayer as he helps the housing market. So we are we're working through those numbers with him. And, uh, and I, I expect to hear some more from him in the next couple of weeks. Well, on the behalf of the many, many, the millions of Americans who are dealing with this issue, uh, I would ask you to uh, use your most convincing voice uh, to try to get him to move off the dime. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. I want to thank our witnesses. Uh, we did get you out pretty close to the 12 o'clock. You extended your willingness to answer far beyond the initial scope. I would only ask one more item. Uh, please, uh, the next time we invite you back, remember that this was, uh, this was a committee that has worked a lot in areas that overlap and accept our invitation as you so graciously did this time. And with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>